Welcome back chemists. Uh, we've been talking about the language of chemistry and today we're going to talk about mixtures of things. We actually saw that with a sample of sunblock in the previous lesson, but I want to look a little bit at more common mixtures that we may be familiar with. Uh, things like foods, like this chocolate bar or even this chili pepper. Uh, almost every food we encounter is a mixture of chemical substances and it makes a really good illustration of how chemists have the problem of having to separate those mixtures into different identifiable substances. If we're ever going to learn about how chemists make molecules, we need to be able to talk about how they can separate and identify them. And that's what a lot of this first unit is really all about. So uh, what's in a chocolate bar? Let's start off with what's on your screen right now. Well, a chocolate bar is a mixture of various pure substances, many different compounds. You could break them up into three different categories. There are certainly the sugars, in fact, in most milk chocolates, that's the number one ingredient is sugar. Uh, things like sucrose, lactose, also known as milk sugar. Fats, things like trilorial glycerol or lecithin are found in uh, chocolates, cocoa fats. Fat is not a specific molecule, but a class of molecules. These are specific examples of pure substances in front of you. And then I'll just say other, many other things, three of which are things like vanillin, caffeine, and threobromine. Those are some flavoring and stimulant agents that you find in, in most chocolates. These are all pure substances, meaning they um, cannot be broken down into simpler substance by simple physical separations. Uh, they don't have to be chemically decomposed into, into different substances, and that's what our bodies uh, do when we uh, metabolize and digest foods. And there on your screen are some pictures of the sucrose, the lactose molecule, uh, the fat molecules, and some of those other flavoring molecules. We could do this for a pepper too. Here's a picture of three peppers from my kitchen just this morning. Uh, peppers have different colors, often due to carotenoids, such as the perhaps the familiar beta carotene molecule, which looks like that. Uh, uh, they often have chlorophyll. Most plants have chlorophyll. You should know about that from photosynthesis in your biology class. Most fruits and most foods, frankly, contain some amount of water. If I had to separate it out, that's one thing I could imagine separating from certainly fruits and vegetables. Uh, and other compounds, the E2-hexenal is a, a flavoring agent that actually sticks around, very small molecule, and you can see there's quite a variety of different types of molecules from the complicated chlorophyll to that very simple aldehyde that you see. And this is in no way a complete list of what would be found in a pepper. There's millions of more compounds that are present there, and even chemical reactions that happen as things like the chlorophyll molecule turn into other substances, including the carotenoids. So let's say I had one of these, and I didn't actually know what was in something like a pepper, and I wanted to figure that out. Well, I would first have to separate it into different substances, and that's what you see on your lesson for today. These are five common laboratory techniques that every AP chemist should know about to separate a mixture into its pure substances, starting with just physical separations by phase. So filtration is how we separate insoluble solids from liquids. Imagine having a mixture of just sand and water, you could send it through a piece of filter paper and the sand would not go through because it's insoluble, it doesn't go in. Same thing happens if you ever make your own coffee and you're using a coffee filter, the grinds stay on top and then the liquid passes through. That also interestingly has extraction associated with it as well as the hot water extracts things from coffee grinds into what becomes the beverage. Um, using a centrifuge to do centrifugation is very similar to filtration except it separates solids that are not just insoluble, but very suspended uh, in something that's a colloidal mixture or just something that looks murky enough that you could actually uh, separate it by uh, an acceleration that happens in a device called a centrifuge where they effectively spin small test tube-like containers of a mixture and the denser part, the, the suspended particles will sink to the bottom of the test tube and you literally just pour off the liquid, AKA decant the liquid uh, out of the tube or whatever the device is, and, and you have your two phases separated from each other. Uh, we can separate phases from other things of the same phase. For example, a liquid-liquid mixture would best be separated by distillation. If I had something like water and an alcohol or organic solvent that they were soluble with each other, uh, I could use distillation, which is boiling and then condensing, as long as they have different boiling points. This is primarily used for liquids that are miscible, meaning they're mixable, they mix with each other. Not all liquids are miscible. Uh, there are other devices for separating immiscible liquids. Um, and then what about separating a solid from, from other solids or from a, a mixture of other solids, let's say in an aqueous mixture? Crystallization is a really good technique for that. If you've ever made rock candy in the past, 
uh, that's just sugar crystals grown out very slowly. It's similar to precipitation. However, that word we use primarily to mean making a solid from a chemical reaction. Crystallization usually refers to solidification very slowly uh, by something having its solubility change based on amount of solvent or temperature or something like that. In fact, toward the end of the year, we will grow our own crystals and study their very interesting properties. So these are all techniques for separating things, and most of these you've probably had a little bit of experience with. What you might not have seen that often is chromatography, and that's a very useful one, and it's not limited to one phase or another. Uh, it separates almost all kinds of substances based on their affinity for what we call a mobile phase. Actually, it's difference in affinity for a mobile phase versus a stationary phase. And I have a picture on your notes there that just shows ink chromatography uh, working its way up a piece of paper, chromatography paper by capillary action. And you can see on the left, it starts out as a band of what looks like a black ink, which is usually made out of different pigments. Um, or organic dyes, depending on what's used for the color. Pigment's usually used for uh, a solid substance, a mineral, uh, and a dye is usually used for a, a colored organic substance, but they both usually have color in the visible spectrum. And it looks like it's eluding up a piece of paper by capillary action and taking the colors at different rates. Uh, I have an animation that shows this. Let's go to that and take a look. Here is uh, a simulator of a piece of chromatography paper. On the left is a sample of pure blue ink, and in the middle, a sample of yellow. On the right, what looks like green, and this is just suspended to a lid, which we can lower into a chamber. And then as time is elapsing, you can see the solvent working its way up that piece of paper, and the different substances have different affinities for the mobile phase. That's what allows chromatography to separate these substances. In this case, we're separating and identifying them by matching them to a known substance. So I'm gonna skip over those questions, but you can look at that animation another time in class. So um, that is what today's lesson was all about. How do we think about mixtures that make up all kinds of things around us? Mixtures are made out of pure substances, and that's what makes up matter. And we can separate mixtures into those pure substances. Coming up next, we're going to talk about how we identify those substances once we've separated them, and slowly work our way into learning how to use them uh, for useful chemical reactions. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.